Hey guys, alright? Welcome everyone. The story begins three years after a global calamity in which thousands of creatures emerged from the ground and attacked humans. These beings were nicknamed Reapers and, for unknown reasons, their activity never occurs above 8,000 feet. The few humans who survived are those who were above that line or managed to get there quickly. One of them is a boy named Hunter, who lives in a community high in the Rocky Mountains. Today, he is secretly venturing below the limit. Through binoculars, he observes the children playing on the mountaintop next door until a noise catches his attention. He grows worried and decides to return to the top. The noise intensifies rapidly, and it becomes clear that the underground creatures are coming after him in a heavy gallop, accompanied by an intense and horrifying roar. When Hunter reaches the line, the Reaper appears in a glance right behind him. The 8,000-foot line is precisely marked, and the creature turns back as soon as it reaches it, while the boy catches his breath, very scared. The community at the top of this mountain is Lost Gulch Refuge, which has fewer than 200 residents. Hunter's father is a man named Will, who is getting increasingly worried about him. The boy confesses that he crossed the safe line and tries to explain himself, saying he just wanted to see more people. Besides that, most of the monsters are in a long period of inactivity. Will explains that the behavior was irresponsible, but speaks to his son in a caring tone. After the conversation, he goes hunting with his friend Katie, who takes down a deer. While they carry the animal, she asks what is going on with Hunter. He tells her about the incident and mentions that Hunter was spying on the village of Red Rock, where there are several children his age. Katie is a bit more understanding and reminds her friend that Hunter is the only child in Lost Gulch. She agrees that his safety is a priority, but argues that many people have not adapted well to the cruel isolation. However, Will suspects that the disobedience had another reason. He thinks Hunter wanted to see the place where he last saw his mother. Will's neighbor is a woman named Nina, who is always shooting at something, as well as conducting mysterious experiments with ammunition. Early in the morning, Will is haunted by memories of his wife, Tara. She insisted on going with Nina on a dangerous expedition below the line and never returned. Besides the longing, Will now has to deal with the responsibility of raising Hunter alone. This is even harder because the boy has a serious respiratory illness and needs to use a specific device to manage his crises. A few days pass, and Will continues his son's education, teaching him farming and fishing techniques. On the boy's birthday, he resorts to bartering to get the last package of macaroni and cheese. In front of his favorite dish, Hunter is amazed by his father's prowess, but soon another difficult conversation begins. He questions the rare use of the radio, but Will explains that they cannot waste electricity during winter, as the days are shorter and they depend on solar energy. Their case is even worse due to the medical device, which consumes a lot of energy. Approaching this topic, Hunter asks when his father will make the next expedition, suspecting it will be soon. Will admits that the filter for the device is running low and he will have to find another one. Later, Katie visits Will, and the two talk about the past. He says he hated going on outings with his wife's family, but now he even misses that. On another night, the boy Hunter has another crisis, and Will needs to give him an injection instead of resorting to the device. He then decides to seek more filters at a hospital in the Boulder area and invites his neighbor to go along. Nina is the only one who survived an encounter with the creatures, besides having dedicated herself to studying them, always looking for a weakness. The previous year, she took Tara on an expedition to her old laboratory, promising to return with a solution. Since that plan failed, Nina claims to have lost hope, but Will does not believe that. He says he has charted a route through the mines that cross the mountain inside, passing through the forbidden territory only in two short sections. Nina retorts that the hospital itself is 600 meters below the safe line. With no more arguments left, Will ends the conversation by saying that she owes him a favor after what happened with Tara. After he leaves, Nina struggles with the traumatic memories of her encounter with the underground beasts. Early in the morning, Will leaves his son with a friend and goes to get the necessary weaponry for the journey. It is then that Katie appears, determined to go as well. Just like Hunter, she does not want to live trapped at high altitudes forever, and says that knowing the enemy better is the first step to defeating it. Trying to scare the girl, Nina says that she has no idea what she is going to face. 
These beings easily tear victims apart, and even a shot to the forehead only stops the Reapers for a few seconds. As she tells Katie that this is a one-way trip, Will promises his son that he will return soon. The three then begin their journey, and Nina continues with her usual lack of tact, as well as drinking non-stop. Despite this, she is extremely useful and even brought an adapted compass capable of detecting the proximity of reapers through electromagnetism. Arriving at the fearsome boundary, she consults the device before crossing the line, verifying that there are none of the creatures around. Upon finding some military vehicles, Will decides to search them for ammunition or anything useful. He is impressed by Katie's familiarity with heavy weapons, to which she simply replies that she grew up in Texas. Nina begins to delay the schedule due to yet another one of her experiments. In response to Katie's complaints, she accuses the girl of being a useless burden and insinuates that she only came along because she is interested in Will. Losing her composure, Katie starts to punch her, and Will rushes in to break up the fight. Nina takes it all in stride, already used to irritating people to that extent. Moving on, the three are startled by the sound of whinnies in the middle of the forest, but then realize it is just a group of horses. The risky stretch is almost over when they arrive at a ski area called Alta Vista. There is a cable car that takes you to the top of the mountain, but the battery is unlikely to work after so long, and the walk takes only 10 minutes. But then Nina consults the compass and discovers that there is no time. In the midst of the vegetation, the sinister glow that the reapers have at the tip of their tentacles can already be seen. Nina runs to the cable car, but Katie does not trust the battery and takes another direction. The two stop when the glow disappears, still suspicious of the quietness. Will begins to tinker with the generator, and then Katie spots the creature coming towards her. Not even her heavy arsenal is enough to take down the beast, and the horns re-emerge in the smoke after each explosion. Katie gives up on the counterattack and starts to run. The cable car operates, and the other two quickly settle into a cart. Knowing that she will not cross the line in time, Katie begins to climb one of the pillars of the structure while Will shoots at the Reaper, trying to stun it. He almost falls from the top when the creature shakes the support cable. At the top of the structure, Katie gathers her courage for the jump but miscalculates. She falls behind the cart and only does not crash to the ground because Will holds her hand. The entire structure begins to bend under the weight, but the cable car keeps moving forward, and Nina says they are almost there. Then the Reaper strikes the cables again, shaking the cart violently. The three plummet, hitting the ground just steps from the line. Running frantically, they cross the limit just in time and collapse on the other side. The Reaper halts its gallop without crossing the line, much to everyone's relief. They spend the night at the resort's hotel, and Nina even arranges for a fancy drink to toast another day of survival. Will starts to ask about her research, hoping to learn more about the Reapers. Confessing that she does not know much, Nina says the key is to understand what happened three years ago. These beings appeared simultaneously worldwide and did not attack any other living beings besides humans. They did not stop to eat or sleep until they had eliminated all the people within their reach. Suspecting that Nina is not saying everything she knows, Will recalls the conversation he had with Tara before the last trip to the laboratory. He pleaded with her not to go with Nina, saying she is the type of scientist who wants success at all costs. For that same reason, Tara believed she could save the world from the Reapers and refused to put her own safety above that chance. She also anticipated the issue of the filters and did not want to leave it until the last minute, as Will ended up doing now. The next day, the travelers arrive at the entrance of the mine, and Will explains the path. Hearing that the exit is a mere 7 meters from the limit, Nina begins to question this plan. She fears that the tunnels may not be perfectly straight and any variation in altitude could be fatal. Under pressure, Will eventually confesses that there is a short stretch below the line. The two become very angry with him, especially because the compass will not work inside the tunnel. Despite the protests, they decide to accompany him anyway. However, the three soon hit an unforeseen blockage and are forced to take a parallel tunnel that is almost entirely below the line. At the top of the staircase to the other level, Katie gets startled by a bat flying directly at her. Asking for a few minutes before facing the crossing, she shares about her last day before the apocalypse, revealing that she was beaten by her boyfriend. Nina reacts to this seriously, showing compassion for the first time. 
Well regrets interrupting the budding friendship but warns that they need to descend this staircase now. Down below, they try to control their fear to keep their breathing steady, as the reapers can detect carbon dioxide very quickly. This strategy lasts only until the first suspicious noise. Will asks the two to cover their flashlights, and as the tunnel goes dark, the illuminated tip of a tentacle becomes visible. Now the rush is inevitable, and the trio even gets lost, entering a dead end. As an abandoned cart blocks the passage for the huge beast for a few seconds, the trio curls up in a corner of the mine and holds their breath. A tentacle approaches them, inspecting every inch meticulously. Near suffocation, Will diverts the attention with a flare so the trio can breathe a little. Then Katie sees an opening in the wall, and they all rush there, crawling through the narrow passage. Unfortunately, the exit is no safer than the entrance, and there is a reaper right next to them, waiting for them. Katie is hit in the chest by a tentacle that impales her, and Will is distraught seeing his friend being dragged into the darkness. With no time to mourn the loss, the two realize that the creature is already returning. Will runs for the nearest staircase, with Nina right behind him. The noises get louder and closer as they panic up the steps. Reaching the level above, Nina finds one of the exits and the two run outside. Will is surprised to see the scientist in tears, making the sign of the cross. Quickly returning to her normal personality, Nina explains that she is asking God for help for her revenge. Nearby, the two find a small abandoned ranch and decide to take a break to rest. Ironically, the available meal is macaroni and cheese. A little more united after the loss, they finally talk about Tara and the unsuccessful trip to the laboratory. Nina explains that the scales covering the reapers have a type of electric charge that can be used against them. She wanted to reach the laboratory to develop a special projectile that would cause the organism's internal combustion upon contact with the scales. Will is not very impressed with the lesson and resents even more knowing that he lost Tara because of an unproven theory. The next day, the two take the truck from the ranch and head to Boulder. After a brief dramatic pause in front of the line, Will accelerates at full speed, passing more aimless horses and the craters the reapers left in the ground. As expected, the town is completely deserted, and the hospital is practically destroyed. Will cannot find the filters where he expected them to be, which causes the duo to waste more time searching. When he finally finds what he wanted, Nina is already shouting for him to hurry up, as a reaper is very close. He fills the bag with filters, and they both run for the exit. In the hallway, sharp tentacles pierce the wall in various places, blocking their way. The duo is forced to run in the opposite direction and up to the second floor. Leaning against another wall, Will is suddenly ensnared by an enormous tentacle. Seeing that shooting won't work, Nina grabs an axe and strikes the scaly skin with all her might, not even leaving a scratch. But at least the attack irritates the reaper enough to let go of Will. Nina pulls a lever that fills everything with smoke as they run into the next room. The sinister glow appears amidst the fog for a few moments and then disappears, as if the beast had given up. Seconds later, the monster suddenly charges forward at full speed. Then Will shoots at a row of oxygen tanks, causing an explosion that sends the reaper through the window. The two watch the fallen beast in the courtyard, not believing it is truly dead. On the way out of the hospital, Nina says her laboratory is nearby, but Will does not want to risk going there. He came to find the filters for Hunter's device, and now they need to return as soon as possible. Nina argues that these filters will last a year at most, and Will will have to repeat this adventure until there are no more left. If she can develop an efficient weapon, hope will spread and the whole world will come to fight by her side. Will finds himself in the same situation Tara was in a year ago and surprises himself by agreeing with Nina. As they return to the truck, the Reaper begins to rise in the hospital courtyard. Arriving at the laboratory, Nina says she just needs five minutes. The compass does not indicate any threat nearby, but still, Will stays on guard. Seeing a photograph on Nina's old desk, he discovers that she had a husband and children. She tries to stay indifferent when he brings it up, but her facade crumbles when she sees the photo again. Nina was the only one who survived because she was in the laboratory, working on a Saturday instead of going to her son's soccer game. She finally apologizes for risking Tara's life. Will also regrets all the bitterness and says he no longer wants to blame her for it. Nina then finishes preparations and tests the projectile. 
Unfortunately, the experiment is a failure. She does not give up and tells Will to go back alone, as she prefers to continue trying other variations. He does not want to leave her behind, but Nina insists on staying. Her own car is still in the parking lot, and she can return by herself later. Will realizes he will not make her change her mind. Besides that, he does not want to risk staying below the line any longer, as Hunter will not survive if he does not return. As he leaves Boulder, she tests the second projectile, just as useless as the first. Not realizing that the compass needle is moving, she seems to have a sudden inspiration. Not even the sound of the Reaper's gallop interrupts her scientific fervor, and when the third projectile is ready, she decides to test it in a real situation where a monster approaches her. Meanwhile, a flat tire causes the truck to overturn on the road, just before reaching the line. Will loses consciousness for a moment and wakes up in despair. He struggles to unbuckle the seatbelt and then kicks out the windshield several times. He does not even need the compass to know that a reaper is lurking, as the beast's characteristic sounds are already loud and close. Seen from above, Will appears extremely defenseless against the swift reaper. He continues to climb the rest of the way with great effort, but then sees that there is a second reaper between him and the line. To make matters worse, a third is approaching from the other side. Will is completely surrounded, and his chances of escape are minimal. It is then that Nina appears behind the reaper and shoots it. The creature simply explodes into dust. The same happens to the other two when Nina angrily fires using her scientifically modified bullets. Will can hardly believe his luck, and is even more shocked to see what remains of the reapers, realizing that they are not animals, but machines. Nina comments that she always suspected the coordinated initial attack, as well as the specific altitude limit. None of this is instinct, it's programming. Will asks who is behind this, but she does not answer. The two then return to Lost Gulch, and Hunter is very happy to see his father. Nina raises the pirate flag, spreading the good news to the other communities, and it does not take long before the production of the miraculous bullets begins. After paying tribute to Katie, Will and Nina are the first to cross the line with a group of volunteers to fight the Reapers, which soon start exploding in heaps across the mountain. Days later, Nina and Will watch the night sky and notice bright spots approaching the Earth, which could confirm the origin of the first Reapers.